So I started in 1975 at the Harvey Community Health Plan right out of my internship residency in cardiology training at the Brigham, which was at that time called the Peter Benton Brigham. I'd had the um, benefit of being exposed to Robert Ebert, who was the dean of the Harvard Medical School at that time during my medical school years. And uh, Dr. Ebert was, in my mind, uh, one of the forgotten heroes, is one of the forgotten heroes of the era that we're now in. And I'll try to showcase that for you in a few minutes with a slide. But um, to get back to my street cred, so I tried to calculate the other day uh, how many patients I've seen. I think I, I can honestly say that somewhere around 200,000 encounters, uh, more than 100,000 of them in the office environment, uh, many in an emergency room environment, and uh, obviously many as a bedside cardiologist at the Brigham over the years. Um, I gave up practice reluctantly in 19... Uh, 2008, I'd been the chairman of the um, Harvard Vanguard Medical Association, I previously had been chairman of the physicians group within Harvard Community Health Plan and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, and then, um, but always practicing full time. And my era of full time is 80 hours plus a week. And, and uh, then was the first chair of Harvard Vanguard Medical Associates when it spun off of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare in 1998. Uh, we say 98, but it was actually 97. And then finally had been the chair of Atrius Health um, after it had evolved as a consortium of, of uh, five medical groups in the greater Boston area at that time. And um, I was pretty much at end of practice career and the opportunity to assume the leadership of um, Atrius Health and Harvard Vanguard in the era emerging post chapter 58 of healthcare reform was an exciting opportunity for me because I'd always had a, a more than a casual interest in the delivery of healthcare. Uh, but I think more important to what I talk to you about today is that I actually do what you do and care about what you do. And I care deeply about the experience that our patients have. But because of the experience I've, I, I, that I've had, uh, I care deeply about the experience of the population, and I care most deeply about the impact of health care on us as a nation. This week is actually the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. You know, I remember when that was delivered. I doubt many of you do. Uh, I was a freshman in college at a totally segregated, lily-white Southern University. And in fact, during my first year there, they integrated the university uh, with one uh, lovely, courageous black woman who had a whole dormitory to herself surrounded by the National Guard. It was the year after uh, James Meredith had integrated uh, the University of, of Mississippi. So as a son of the South and as a person who's seen great social change, I really imagine this moment in our collective national history as just yet another chapter. Some people call me an ideologue, and I don't think that's true. I'm pragmatic. I can tell you that healthcare reform, as it's evolving, is not the way I would do it. I would not do a mandate. I would make everyone entitled. I wouldn't do uh, healthcare reform economics through an evolution of fee-for-service and uh, total medical expense. I would go right back to prepaid health care and capitation because I think it's cleaner, easier to administer, more likely to deliver the care that people need. If we could learn where we went wrong with the first iteration, I like to think of it as being maybe um, capitation 2.0, but that's not the way the world works. And so you and I will have to make the best of what we're able to negotiate with one another over what will be your career and my emerging experience as a Medicare patient. <laughs> so so that's, it's, it's, this is a very important opportunity for me to be able to speak to you. I um, had the experience about five years ago of attending a seminar at Dartmouth and spent the whole day sitting next to Paul Batalton. How many of you know who Paul Batalton is? Okay, he's one of the founders of IHI pediatrician, he's been at Dartmouth for quite a few years. Uh, his e research interest was in microsystems performance, which I think is a pretty interesting concept. 
And uh, towards the end of the day, I, 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 I had just all day long had the experience that this person was actually not feeling well or depressed. You know, as clinicians, how you can just sort of get the vibe when you walk into the exam room. So I worked up the courage to ask him what was going on. And he said, you know, here I am. I think at that time he was about my age now, 68. He said, you know, I'm, I'm ready to retire. And I realize how vulnerable everything we have done is. It's about the transfer to a new generation of cl clinical leaders, a new generation of practitioners, and I'm just not sure we'll make the transition. Uh, his famous statement, I don't know if I said it a while ago, was every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. You've heard that, if you didn't know the name Paul Batalin. Well, it's that, he's the origin of that statement. We're a very wise man. And, you know, I said to myself, you know, he is right. It is not going to be for me or Paul or Don Berwick or, you know, uh, Dr. Dupuy or, we're done. It is actually for you. So what we're talking about today, I feel is extremely important because I have lots and lots of information, more than I can write down, and I try to write every week. I send out a newsletter to our staff that's pretty long and people like to complain about how it is. But I, I feel like there is so much that needs to be transferred in terms uh, that people can understand. I, I really believe in the dichotomy between left and right brain thinking. And um, most of us actually hang facts on stories uh, and, and learn from hearing experience. That's how you get your clinical education, right? That's all the words are about, are stories. I remember a patient when. And so translating that from the data into a position where we can collect data and use it in a way to actually affect results is an important part of what I hope Atrius Health is about. But let me just show you a little bit of who we are, and then I hope this will be very interactive because I, I would like very much to talk with you. So we are a large organization. We take care of about a million patients now. Uh, there are seven groups. We've tried to be innovative in that our seventh group is actually a, a visiting nurses association with now more than 500 VNAs because uh, as of September the 1st, VNA of Boston will be part of it as well. So we now have a VNA footprint that actually covers the same map as our practices. And I'll show you in just a little while how that makes a difference in our results and how it is going to be, uh, I think, foundational to a goal that I have, which is that patients are no longer admitted to the hospital for ambulatory sensitive conditions that it's a sentinel event. If a person goes to the hospital for congestive heart failure or an exacerbation of COPD or a complication of their diabetes. I think that's a waste. If you look at how many people are admitted now, uh, hospital uh, admissions, it's about 50% of the admissions. Every one of those I think is reclaimable to the benefit and the advantage of the patient, the patient's family, and to us as a society in terms of cost. So that's, a, that's an audacious goal. But uh, it's part of the thinking that's behind what we try to do. So we are a very, very um, fortunate organization because we have the benefit of a very long history of people who've been trying to think about population care and people who've been thinking about how to more efficiently and effectively deliver care, um, how to work in teams, you know, not all of our clinicians can talk that way, but most of them have experienced it in ways that m many of their colleagues in the community never have. Um, we have, for more than a decade, had a very functional and uh, effective data warehouse, I believe more in our data than the data that comes from the payers, <laughs> although a lot of the data that's in our data warehouse does come from the payers, but we analyze it very effectively. Uh, we've invested in population management tools. Um, we certainly have a history of global payment. I had not seen, we used to facetiously in our organization call it free for service because if someone who didn't have uh, the, the prepaid health care wandered into one of our sites, we really didn't know how to deliver a bill <laughs> to someone to get paid for the service. Um, about 12, 13 years ago now, we had to learn how to do that on a dime because Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare at that time was our only insure, only source of patients and they um, went into a financial tailspin. The result was 30% of, 30 of our patients left in one year. 
Uh, if you lose 30% of your revenue in one year, you're experiencing a significant financial stress. I can remember when the, uh, <laughs> when the folks from uh, uh, Price Waterhouse said, you know, Dr. Lindsay, this is not a going concern. I, I said, you mean the fact that we don't have the money to cover payroll on Thursday, this being Tuesday, uh, should concern me? And they said, yes. <laughs> and, and so that was how deep we sank. Uh, and some of the managerial uh, decisions that we had to make at that time were awful. I say that we burned the furniture to get through the winter. Uh, we literally did. And uh, we sacrificed case management people. We sacrificed clinicians. Uh, but we got through the winter. And I personally resolved at that time that we would not expose ourselves to a similar situation in the future. And um, I should tell you that piece of the story because I think it fits into the whole picture. So, if you're sitting then in our organization having recovered, say, 2005 or 6, experiencing year-over-year 10% -year increases in reimbursement, pretty good, right? Feels great. But you say to yourself, can this go on forever? This makes no sense. The economy's growing at 2 to 3%. That's, that's just not sustainable, right? You don't have to be an economist to be able to figure that one out. Uh, and so I said to myself, sitting with one of my colleagues, let's, let's just calculate what would happen if we went from 8% year over year to 4% year over year in one fell swoop. Well, at that time, it was about $180 million of income because we're a $2 billion organization, okay? That was a lot of money. Could we absorb that sort of loss? Well, since we're like the grocery store business and we operate at margins that are like 1% to 2 to 3% on a great year, uh, the answer is no. We couldn't. So you would have to prepare. And I think that's the major responsibility of leadership is not only to be happy in the moment, but to be thinking about what follows this. And you get that from your clinical practice, right? When you're sitting there in the office seeing a diabetic, they may look great. Their glycohemoglobin is 8.4, and uh, you, know, you know that, and you know what it might mean, but it's not going to determine what they eat for supper that night or how they choose to spend the next week unless you actually bring it to their attention in an actionable way. So imagine that then in the context of an organization full of clinicians who've gone through a very significant period of um, personal and organizational stress and you tell them, guys, it's time to go on a diet. It's not going to be easily received. But uh, to um, the credit of many of the people who work in our organization, people did begin to take that sort of thing seriously. And it's good to have an organizing principle whenever you're uh, doing something with a large number of people. And, and the concept is keep it simple, right? I think Tom Nolan uh, and the others at IHI who evolved the triple aim, believe it or not, this shows you how fast the intellectual uh, presentation of this material, it was articulated when? 2007, not very long ago. I heard Tom Nolan speak uh, at a, um, an event in Washington uh, the day or so after the last election when it was clear that the president had been reelected and that all of those that had hoped that they wouldn't have to deal with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act would have their wish, and it was. And it was a, it was a wonderful day. There was a, uh, I got to hear Don Berwick in conversation with Tom Daschle and, and uh, former Senator Frist. Um, that, there was a seminar later in the day, though, where it was uh, Gary Kaplan, the very insightful and fantastic leader of Virginia Medical Center, in conversation with Tom Nolan and Maureen Bisciano, who's now the CEO heading IHI. And uh, Nolan said something that really hit me. He, he based it off of, of uh, Harvard Business School, um, Harvard Business Review article, articles from March of 2002 that looked at competitiveness of the United States in reference to the rest of the world and tried to extract from that a sense of, okay, what about healthcare? And he said it really boils down to three things. If we as clinicians are going to be able to lead our practices, our patients, and our communities to anything that re resembles stability, it will require that we just do three things. Number one is to develop a capacity for working in commons. 
Now, I don't know if you know the paper by Garrett Hartnett on the tragedy of the commons and the application by Don Berwick and others at the IHI of that concept. It was also um, uh, the thesis of, um, blocking on the name of the economist from Indiana who, who um, uh, actually won the Nobel Prize for further expanding uh, the concepts of how commons work, as in fisheries and things of that sort. So we need to develop a commons philosophy to healthcare, i.e. you don't need, as we now have, three bone marrow transplant programs uh, so closely located that a reasonably proficient major league outfielder could stand in one spot and throw a baseball and hit each of them, you know, which you can do in Boston right now. <laughs> They're high overhead, very, very intense investments, and that's not good economics, right? So commons. The second thing, and there's a lot of this in ACO thinking. I'm laying the groundwork for some of the stuff we're going to talk about later. The second thing is some process improvement. Okay? We all manage by objective. Oh, we should lower the cost of care. What does that get you? Headaches. You actually have to have a methodology. Process produces results which are exactly what the objectives were. You can't just throw out objectives and expect that you're going to have anything other than disappointment or a lot of attempts at frustrating, conflicting innovation. You know, a capitalistic society is built on the idea that you know, people will establish objectives and be creative in getting it. In a large, complex industry like healthcare, though, I'm not so sure it's the right way to go. So we need to have, to repeat again, we need to have commons activities, we need to have competency of process improvement, whatever you want to call it, lean, six sigma, some combination of all the above. And finally, we need to do what every good business person actually does, but as a profession we've forgotten, and that is to put everybody else's interests in front of ours. You know, we talk about patient-centeredness, and it, it's, it's interesting for me to hear different interpretations of what that means. But we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about the experience of the patient. Uh, wonderful uh, patient-family-centered program at the University of Pittsburgh run by a very creative orthopedic surgeon, Tony DiPiorio, Di Di uh, who has literally followed patients and their families around and, and it's amazing. I mean, what they see in terms of the dysfunction that we ask people to put up with and the expense in the context of improving their health. So I'll get off the, I'll say, get off that soapbox and get on another one. So this is not new. So Dean Ebert, my mentor, I didn't realize it when I entered Harvard Medical School in September of 1967 that the next week he was going to deliver a speech, I mean the next month at Simmons College where he made this statement that I later found. Uh, and I didn't realize he had a plot to produce physicians who were socially responsible, but that was basically what he was about. And uh, I was one of the test subjects, I guess. But anyway, he said the existing deficiencies in healthcare cannot be corrected simply by supplying more personnel, more facilities, and more money. What he's saying there, it's about design, okay? It's about design. It's how you put the system together. These problems can only be solved by organizing the personnel facilities and financing into a conceptual framework and operating system that will provide amply for the health needs, wow, 1967, of the population. As providers, we're numerator thinkers. That's my patient. I'll give spectacular care to my patient. That's why we have you know, wonderful successes in transplant and within a quarter mile have people dying of preventable diseases because we're not thinking about the population or the distribution of our resources to cover what our real responsibility is. Not only the individual, but the community in which he or she lives because that has a huge impact on their health, the health of their children, the health of their parents. Uh, 
quite frankly, the health of the society. So we now live in a society where in this state we spend more than 40 cents of every tax dollar on health care. So for the last billion dollars that we've added to education, where did it go? To paying retiree health benefits for teachers. Not for blackboards or laptops or, or iPads or for better training programs, but for that. The governor, a year or so ago, I, gone, I enjoy going to his state of the state addresses, uh, prior to the passage of chapter 224 was talking about health care. Last year he said not one, but one sentence about it. Basically the job is done. Past 224, things are fixed. But then he started talking about raising taxes for infrastructure, right? He didn't connect the dots. You know, the money you're spending on health care could actually finance the infrastructure. So I figured out if we don't watch out, pretty soon there'll be toll booths on Beacon Street and Route 9 because that basically seems to be how the legislature has decided to raise the money for the transportation infrastructure that we need. Because nobody wants to pay more personal taxes. But, but that is the place where we, we are really not looking at the big picture of how healthcare economics has distorted all of the possibilities. I graduated from Harvard Medical School virtually free because I happened to have the good luck of coming along in what was called the Great Society. Uh, I actually owed $10,000 at five and a quarter percent interest. I didn't have to pay a nickel until actually I was in practice for five years after completely completing my training program. So I got a little coupon book from the Harvard University that had 120 coupons in it for $100.99 each. So I dutifully, over the next 10 years, wrote a check for $100.99. At that time, I was making over $200,000 as a practicing clinician. So piece of cake, why I say it's almost for free. The fact that that was happening in the 70s and is not happening now is a distortion. We're, we're as a society. How many of you have loans in excess of $50,000 that you're still paying? I'll rest my case, okay? We've got a problem that we collect, and so is an ACO the solution to the problems? I don't know, but it feels close to stuff that used to make sense to me. So let me um, proceed here. Of these definitions, the one that comes closest to what feels right for me is the third one, which says in, uh, it's from the NCQA, provider-based organizations that take responsibility for meeting the health needs of a defined population with the goal of simultaneously improving health, improving the patient experience, and reducing the per capita cost. They knew what the triple aim was. It's right there. So the ACO, in my mind, is the organizational device to achieve the triple aim, which is the prescription that the nation needs for some serious social and individual problems. You can see why they call me an ideologue. Okay, so global payment, uh, do provide a financing model for the accountable care organization. Yes, I was absolutely overjoyed when they passed uh, chapter 305. You probably don't follow the state legislature enough to be able to speak to the laws as chapter. Well, chapter 305 was passed in 2009. It, 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 created a commission that then came back with the report that in five years, everyone in Massachusetts would be getting health care uh, that was some form that was financed by global payment. People went nuts, people in medical institutions. And everybody, I said, hey, that's the briar patch into which I want to be thrown. You know, this is, this is like telling me that I won the lottery, you know, because those are the competencies that we have. That's the way we think healthcare should be delivered and uh, bring it on. But what has evolved, and uh, Atul Gawande some years ago wrote an article where he pointed out that, that healthcare economics actually evolves through the established patterns of practice. And, and, and so in this country, culturally, 
we're in the fee-for-service medicine. So global payment now essentially is fee-for-service medicine with a budget. And it's sort of good. I can tell you as a person who's responsible for that very narrow margin, the mechanisms that have evolved are you don't know how much money you will actually have to create the programs of care that your patients need, so you better have some reserves. And you probably won't find out whether you won or lost based on the efforts until about six months after you close the financial books on the year. And, um, you know, that's not a real good environment for uh, rapid improvement. So I think that um, the thinking that Cleve Killingsworth and um, others did at Blue Cross back six, seven years ago was pretty good uh, and certainly not perfect, but you know, the world is built on ideas that then get tried and you discover what's good and what's bad about them. The AQC I like to think of as like training wheels on a bicycle, okay? So if you don't really know how to ride the bicycle, you put on the training wheels and it gives you a little support as you go forward. What the AQC did for my organization, I can remember De negotiating this with Cleve. Cleve said, I, I think we just ought to drop the, the cost of care. I said, Cleve, <clears throat> that'd be like rupturing the papilla your papillary muscle. You know, you'll, you'll suddenly go into congestive heart failure because you can't manage, you know, the sudden increase in pulmonary pressure that you'll experience. If you do that to my organization, we're toast. We can do that. That's sort of like gradually developing mitral regurg over a long period of time, right? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay. <laughs> That I can handle. I can adjust to it. Uh, we can begin to build the ways in which we deal with, I'm thinking we gotta get on to lean quick, uh, deal with the realities of the future. Healthcare will be uh, not financed the way it used to be. So it was long term, five years, a nice slope. Um, and there, it's connected to the economy. Good. That, that there needs to be that, that reconnection to the economy if we're ever going to get there, and it does have quality measures. So if Rosalie and I think back about what's different about now versus when we were in those first attempts at managed care, a couple of things. Number one, we have things like DXCG, where we can actually look at a population and say, what is the density of disease in this population right now? What are our best practices and what should it cost in the most efficient and effective organizations to deliver the care that's needed? There was a disconnect between what was needed and what was provided in terms of finance at that time. It got worse when people who were interested in making money rather than improving care moved in and corrupted the idea with all sorts of get-rich-quick schemes, and there were plenty, particularly, I can tell you, IPAs where doctors became multimillionaires by denying care. So I don't know if any of you remember the movie, As Good As It Gets, where Helen Hunt won an Oscar for standing up and shouting about her HMO. I was sitting there, it was 1998, and the whole theater just stands up and cheers. I said, we are toast. You know? <laughs> and we were. It, I mean, that was, the, the public had had it up to here. They weren't going to take the denial of care as the mechanism for healthcare economics any longer. And rightfully so. So having understood that, does it mean the whole concept of prepaid healthcare is wrong? No. You need to know what the resources should be you, need, you should have a system to be most efficient with it, and you should have something that wasn't there before, which is a way for the customer to comment on how the experience of care occurs. So that's why in all of the, I think, acceptable healthcare finance mechanisms, patient satisfaction is huge. Our organization has spent as much time and energy on trying to develop better ways of meeting the needs of the patient as we have had uh, directed at trying to reduce the cost of care. The two go hand in hand, okay? Because patients who are satisfied, who trust their physician, will actually accept and follow a plan of care 
much, much more efficiently than one who's trying to worry about whether they're getting ripped off or will they be denied care. I mean, the basic therapeutic contract, we don't talk about that much anymore, that should exist between a patient and a clinician or between an organization and a population should be about the fact that we're aligned for the same thing, to, to improve your health. Because that's what we're about. That's our mission. That's our goal. That's the primary reason. If we do that well, then yes, then our interests, our own individual personal economic interests should be satisfied. But if we put our interests ahead of the patient, it doesn't work in the end. It just is not good game theory. All right, so um, I thought that was great. So our experience with the AQC actually gave us a lot, I think, of um, insight because these are very complex issues when you begin to think about, okay, how will we try to get back to the good old days when uh, we were thinking about population care? And along about that time, the idea you know, of the, AQ, of, of the ACO began to be a greater and greater conversation. I don't know if you've thought about this, but the Pioneer ACO and all of the evolving mechanisms of global payment, particularly as applied to PPO populations, which Medicare is, have one huge difference with the earlier era of capitation that would have sent the executives of the system that Rosalie and I and Mark Bard worked in bananas. There was no contract that held the patient in the organization. The only thing that holds them there, and you're responsible for the budget, is their satisfaction. It's the therapeutic contract. It's the relationship that they have. And if they don't like what they're getting, if you don't meet their needs, what happens? They go to somebody who does. And then what happens? You get the bill. That's pretty scary. And so I'm a big fan of, of, of um, Elliot Fisher. A lot of people don't know that his father was the famous Robert, Roger Fitcher at, at Harvard Law School who wrote all of the negotiation uh, sort of literature. But anyway, Elliot is a professor at Dartmouth, and he said the best fence is a green pasture. So that really jives with my right brain sort of thinking, right? Uh, green pasture. If you're in a green pasture, why would you wander? You've got everything you want right there. Uh, so, so, in fact, I think that is the core concept of a functional ACO. That it's patient service, it's about what, as Clay, as Clay Christensen says, you know that name, Clay Christensen? Um, great thinker at Harvard Business School, so, so, has sold more business books than anybody in the last 50 years, um, and uh, is the creator of phrases like, um, disruptive innovation, uh, things of that sort. So what is your customer hiring you to do? Now that's distasteful for doctors to think about, but what is it that our patients come in with the expectation of? We often don't ask the question, but if in fact you can fulfill that expectation, if you can understand what they're hiring you to do, they will not go away. So if you're going to be successful, in an ACO environment, you better be real sure that you know what it is that your patients are looking for. Because if they don't find it, they will go elsewhere, and rightfully they should. So I want to sort of switch now to talking about process improvement and just give you a very, very quick primer. How many of you have any concept of Six Sigma, Lean, uh, TQM, all those sorts of things that have evolved? All right, you got a knowledge deficit if you haven't. You need to do some, some learning here. Uh, but it's basically about seeing waste, getting rid of waste. Where is most of the waste in healthcare? Well, it's all over the place, but my idea is mostly in overprocessing and overproduction. Okay, overprocessing is getting another MRI. Uh, you know, overproduction is layers and layers of specialists on top of uh, what should be a system that works. We have a huge professional disease. It's called practice variation. You do it your way, you do it your way. We have some 
unfortunate medical assistant that has to support both of us. That person doesn't know how to do that. So the antidote for a lot of this is a concept that's even more offensive. Standard work. There's a best, least way way at this moment to do everything. And we should all be joined together to find out what that is. You know, we talk about it in terms of, do you need antibiotics for an upper respiratory tract infection? You know, surgeons have sort of naturally known this for a long, long time. They have some little routines, and Atul Gawande has tried to develop that, where, you know, they count sponges and things like that. That's an attempt, you know, at a standardized process. Mark Bard, uh, along with uh, a colleague of his, Mike Nugent, wrote a book called The Accountable Care Organization. Chapter 5 in that, The Sociology of Accountable Care Organization, is must reading for everybody. Because what it does is it points out that all of us are victims of our training. We were trained to be individually responsible, not to trust anybody's judgment but ours, and to demand to have it our way because that was best for the patient. Wrong. It's not best for the patient to have it our way. It's best for the patient if we all collectively together decide what works best, use data to understand what works best, and to systematically remove from you know, our natural reflexes, jumping to solutions and things of that sort that are all individually based and the origin of much malpractice and a great deal of what we call you know, lack of safety. Uh, so I think that, and I can show you data from organizations like Virginia Mason and ThetaCare, when you bring in and really get a group of clinicians and their support to understand these principles, Malpractice goes down. At my last checking, you know, the two most efficient lean organizations in the country, Theta Care and Virginia Mason, had not in several years had a new malpractice case. They were paying their tail. In fact, if you look at the numbers from Virginia Mason, it was the economic difference between before lean and after lean. It was uh, uh, something like a $30 million a year improvement in the cost for malpractice, which was their measurable benefit. That's something you can't read in any journal, but that's my you know, sort of observation as I go around and talk to people. We have in our organization experienced a reduction in our malpractice costs as well. So um, one of the byproducts of practice variation is malpractice. We get sued as individuals. It's bad systems that create the malpractice, a disconnect there. You're responsible for what the system didn't do. You're responsible for not being supported by the system most of the time. And there's good data from the Risk Management Foundation down in Cambridge uh, to support what I just said. All right, so in an ACO, if you don't have lots of flip charts, felt tip pens and stickies, you got no chance. Those are the foundation, it's great to have a data warehouse, but if you don't have these other things and you don't know how to put people together in groups, you're not going to be successful because you can't talk about eliminating practice variation, creating the design of an organization to deliver the service the patient needs without getting people together to talk and drinking lots of coffee and eating bad cookies and, and, and doing that. If you do that, the results are fabulous. The difference between technical <coughs> and adaptive change, because that's what we're talking about. So what is technical change? Technical change is, wow, there's this new scope. How do you use it? Like that, okay. What's the result? Oh, I can see polyps better. Easy to learn, you go to a course. Pretty soon you've got it all set up. What is adaptive change? Adaptive change is practicing in groups. Why? Why is that hard? Well, it's complex. You know, you're not in control of the whole thing yourself. It, um, to solve the problem really requires giving up old habits, things that you were taught are true. If you're 60 plus years old, it means suddenly becoming a novice. Not what you want to be, right? You want to be the king of all there is to know about whatever it is you think you know. And you certainly aren't open to somebody else's new idea. You're going to immediately reject it. 
This has been known since the 14th century when in the prints, if you read, Machiavelli says, if you've got something that's a new improved product, don't expect anybody will like you. Why? Because they've got an economic investment in the old product. Why does the United States have the worst cell phone uh, uh, reception in the world? Because we've got billions of miles of copper wire that people own. They've got an investment. That's got to go away before you know, we can have the same cell phone service they have in South America and China. It's just not going to work that easily because it means giving up something. That's health care. We have to, the change is going to be very difficult. So it involves feelings of loss and sacrifice, betrayal to value. So what was the story of Tool Colt? He told the story about the difference between how quick people accepted anesthesia versus antiseptic surgery. They came along at about the same time, separated by 10 or 15 years. Within seven years of the ether dome experience at the Mass General, you could get general anesthesia in Malaysia anywhere in the world. Lister introduced antiseptic surgery on the basis of his understanding of Pasteur's work and some observations that had been made at a public health level about putting carbolic acid into the water systems of certain European countries and reducing uh, the, the, the frequencies of various epidemics. So, hmm, what if I take all my instruments dip them in this stuff, wash my hands really well, um, coat everything in this stuff. It really stinks. It's a lot of work, but maybe we'll lower the incidence of infection. It took almost 30 years to get people around the world to do that because the surgeon didn't get to walk in in his morning coat all covered with blood because that was macho, chop away, leave. Uh, it really required a lot of dealing with stinky stuff it required focus, attention to detail, anesthesia. The patient stops kicking and screaming. You just squirt the stuff on a rag, put it over their face, and then you get to do your stuff, right? That's the difference. Hard work, adaptive change will take the rest of your career, you know, because this is about changing the way we think, the way we work, the way we address patients, the way we address one another, what we ask of one another as well. So this work, I actually, Jack Silverson's name is on there. Uh, he's famous for describing ape syndrome. You know ape syndrome? Well, it's, it's actually a pejorative term applied to physicians. Uh, Silverson, who's actually a dentist, says it stands for <coughs> the, uh, the desire to be autonomous, protected, and entitled, which <laughs> pretty much describes the way I was trained. You know, I, I, you know, the autonomy is I'll do it my way because this is what works for me. And by the way, it's what my professor told me was his way. Uh, protected, <clears throat> you know, I've got to have these hours, but I've got to arrange my schedule, you know, whatever. Entitled, man, I spent a lot of my, I missed the 60s. I was in the Countway Library. Everybody else was going to, to rock concerts and smoking weed and having good stuff. I am entitled to a good life now because I've given up so much and I work 80 hours a week. That's the, that's the physician culture. You know. And you may not have it in your generation, but trust me, it is embedded there. And giving that up, very difficult. So the author of this work is actually here nearby. It's a guy named Ron Heifus, who's a psychiatrist who teaches at the Kennedy School. But uh, he's the guru of adaptive change. Adaptive change, whether you're cognizant of it or not, will be a major component of the success of ACOs because it's not only the individual physician that has to change, it's the organization, it's the community, it's everything. What if we don't change? Well, things always change. Uh, Churchill said you can trust Americans to do the right thing after they've tried all the wrong things. You know, things will get there uh, sooner or later, but those who actually are cognizant of in their own lives and also in the lives of their organizations about the enormous angst of adaptive change, I think will be a leg up. Our organization has experienced it in spades. And when it really gets bad, I know about it because I'm suddenly 
you know, uh, <coughs> old, uh, ignorant, and uh, have some sort of moral flaw as the general <laughs> rumor uh, in the community. But that's, you know, when we s stop resisting things on the basis of data and uh, our idea about, well, we tried that before it didn't work somehow gets refuted, and when we actually can't s delay the process any longer by suggesting another study, what's left? Attacking individuals. You see it right now in the Affordable Care Act with the politics. When, when everything else is gone, they attack individuals. Change is really difficult. It's a political issue. And, and this is the core of it. It's human being. It means you have to get on a new learning curve. Because if you think about it, the whole program is about paying doctors less, right? Spending less money. So if you think that going into an ACO to make money is an objective, and that's why incentives are very important in healthcare because we still are convinced that if you give somebody some money, they'll do something. There's a ream of literature going back to the early 60s from Harvard Business School and a guy named McGregor uh, that suggests that that just doesn't work. If you want to really read something that's easy to read and fun, Daniel Pink, who also wrote A Whole New Mind, which was a reference to the right brainness, wrote a book called Drive, where he just destroys the concept that financial incentives actually do anything other than short-term targeted uh, initiatives. In the long run, people do things because of the heuristic pleasure, that's the problem-solving pleasure, of, of the intellectual challenge, being a part of something that makes a difference. Those are, those are the sort of motivating factors that really drive uh, progress in almost any industry, in almost any, I mean, even, even Steve Jobs, he wasn't out to make money. You can, you can read Walter Isaacson and, and that comes out real clear. He just thought these things were cool. And he just wanted to see if he could put them together in, in a fashion that would make you think they were cool. You know, the fact that money came out of it, that just, he sort of didn't know what to do with it. And uh, that was, um, it's pretty much true with a lot of things that make a difference. So, why participate? We wanted to leverage the growing learning experience for all of our Medicare patients. We have a huge Medicare Advantage program with Tufts. We thought our results stunk compared to the rest of the market. We were stuck. We couldn't improve those results. They're now improved. But think about it. You take 360 seven-year-old people and line them up up here? Can you tell what their health insurance is? No. If they're frail and elderly, does the one from the Tufts Medicare Advantage group have anything uh, different than the one that's still somehow or another covered by commercial insurance or the one who's now in, a, in, in straight Medicare? No. They all have the same needs, right? So you can study to the test, focus all your efforts on the population that you're at risk for. For us, it was about 30,000 uh, straight Medicare patients, or you can create a system, a design, that covers the whole population and not only learn how to take care of the most complicated and ill, but apply those skills across your entire practice. So that was our strategic goal, okay? So it wasn't to make a quick buck. And if you're going in it that way, you focus on infrastructure, learning, creating teams and competencies. Because remember, I said that processes produce results that then achieve objectives. So the core is process. Okay, so we had a lot. So we knew also that that green pasture thing, what is the largest in the continuously growing market commercially? It's the PPO population. Those people who we just as a culture want choice, okay? So if we're going to contend with that, since we're not going to go back except when the economics get terrible, as Dr. Dupuis very insightfully told you, I heard at the end of his talk, there will be narrow network products, there will be tiered products. It was essentially to try to get some experience addressing these issues that we decided to be a pioneer ACO. So, uh, and we've evolved the phrase that we want to be a system of care because that, that it sounds pretty wonky but that comes closest to Dr. Ebert's concept, and it also fits nicely 
into um, the, the thing of, of design uh, and the fact that we do things together uh, to improve the care of the individual. And uh, you can read the slide about this because we're getting short on time. The uh, Pioneer ACO is nothing I would have ever designed, I can tell you that. I mean, it is a bureaucrat's delight working with CMI, CMMI under Rick Gilfillan, who was the, um, um, if you don't know his personal history, he had been the guy behind Geisinger's health insurance policy. He's a wonderful uh, former primary care physician who's very, very smart and uh, actually did his best dealing with about 18 different government agencies to try to get the cooperation necessary with the safe harbors and the, and the waivers and the things like that to create the um, Pioneer ACO. But as you might imagine, it's a sort of a bureaucratic tangle. But nevertheless, it was brave, and it was a good thing to do, I believe. Uh, but it also, I think, prepares us. I don't know if you know the Affordable Care Act well enough to know that it actually isolates out certain monies to go to CMMI, which is um, the um, Innovation Center within CMS. Uh, to begin to work on some of these pilot programs that might give us answers for the future because, you know, I, d I don't want to totally diss the literature. I think we should be learning and we should be sharing what we learn with one another because these are problems that are, as, I, as far as I'm concerned, just as complicated as eradicating or controlling AIDS or, or other of uh, those things that we consider to be legitimate uh, ways in which to spend our professional time. So, um, the, the finance is rather convoluted, but basically what they do is they take the experience of your population, and like I said, we had 30,000 patients getting care from five different healthcare organizations loosely brought together, sharing data, trying to improve quality together, but not with a common bottom line, uh, which is a point I'll get back to later. So we were not as tightly financially integrated as I've tried to get us to be over the course of the last five years. So I, I have two objectives left in my healthcare career. One is to uh, move Atria's Health to one single physician obligated group because the Pioneer ACOs give us some relief from the Stark laws through uh, waivers. But uh, we are at the level of organizational affiliation that actually allows us to be 1501c3 and avoid taxes but from the point of view of the Stark Laws, we're actually competitors. And so that makes it difficult to create shared programs. So this was our first real shared clinical program. We've had shared programs up to now through a legal device called LLCs, sort of joint ventures. And so we have a joint venture for women's health on the South Shore and a joint venture in cardiology, lots of joint ventures in, in imaging and uh, things of that sort but we haven't had a universal program of shared clinical activity like the Pioneer ACO. So the second problem for us was now we had five groups who all knew each other but had never shared care for the individual with one another. Plus we had just brought in the, um, the first wave of our VNAs. So those were our goals. Uh, so we had a, oh, I forgot to mention. We, all said we're pretty good. So when we, they took your last three years of experience, one other step, uh, they look at the Medicare people who see you and say, how often does this person see you and for what percentage of their care, primary care, do they get from you? And so there's a formula. And so attribution, assigning a patient, occurs by that patient's choices to get care from you. A couple of uh, jinx there because there were some people that got attributed to us who we actually didn't provide care to. They were seen by clinicians who were moonlighting in um, emergency, uh, moonlighting in nursing homes who work for us and, and uh, their provider number got attached to the patient and that got attached to us. But you know, those are the sorts of things that you would imagine in a big population sort of thing. Uh, then they looked at the cost of care over the last three years and said, that's your budget. Well, we've been doing pretty good. So there were five ACOs in this market our budget was about at the closest, nobody shares this data, but it, my best guess, steward aside, because I don't know what their budget was, but between Mount Auburn, BI, partners, and um, us, ours was the lowest. It was uh, 
and well, you'll see the numbers in a minute, around $900. And that budget is actually after you get the raw number per month per patient. After you get the raw number, then you project it forward by a certain amount, and then you're playing the game against that number. Since their data was slow coming to us, we renegotiated with them that our financial year for the first year would be from Q2 2012 through Q1 2013. The data that was reported was on the program's experience from Q1 of 2012 through Q4 2012. So if you heard that Atrius lost money, the actual truth is we were starting with a lower budget in the, not in the noise band. There was a 2% band where you know, uh, there was no gain or loss. Uh, at the end of 2012 for our combined population, which were actually five groups working together for the first time. So our focus on the first year was putting together infrastructure. And um, this is A3 thinking. If you've ever seen um, an A3, which is the basic intellectual tool of, of lean, this is box four. It's essentially a SWOT analysis. Uh, it's, um, if, you do, if you understand scientific method, if you uh, understand plan, study, do, act, you understand lean. That's, it's essentially that carried forward with a lot of new and robust tools and mechanisms to keep the ball moving forward. Uh, so um, in the fishbone analysis, um, things going this way are things that need to be developed. Things going that way are barriers. You can do it either way. Uh, so these are mostly items that needed to be developed. And these were our initiatives. You don't do things that are complex unless you actually have a plan, right? So these were the things that we said, if we can do these things, we will eventually be successful. I told the board I thought we were going to lose quite a bit of money in the first year, and God love him, one of our board members, Pat Ryan, who's the CEO of Press Ganey, said, it's just an investment. And uh, I said, thank you, but we reserved for a $4 million loss anyway and um, went forward. So here, so part of our plan was actually getting back to those VNAs, connecting them in effective fashions with the practices. That's adaptive change. You don't know me, I don't know you, we've got to get together and figure out how we're gonna do something that neither one of us is sure will make a difference, but we're gonna give it a try, right? So we did that pretty successfully and uh, I've got the Tufts Medicare uh, patients here as well because I told you we were trying to, uh, so the first thing we had to do was get our clinicians to send those patients to our VNA partners. Pretty successful. Uh, and um, then we said, well, where are we going to target the first couple of years in our success? And that is, obviously, you go where the biggest expense are, post-acute care readmissions, things of that sort. So it, we, we need, you need to develop a partnership. This is now we're back to the medical commons. So with certain pre preferred hospitals, with certain preferred nursing facilities, uh, so that they will allow you to infiltrate their organizations and actually begin to help them change their processes because you are either the payer or the beneficiary of that activity. And so they got going. So how do you know where the opportunities are? That's where your data warehouse comes in. So we have some pretty creative physicians who actually uh, understand big data. Uh, I don't. I just value the fact that those people are there. And I'm always impressed by what they show me when they bring me their spreadsheets and say, there's an opportunity. And almost always they're right. Uh, and so when you look for the opportunities, um, and um, begin to develop, uh, understand who your patients are, what their needs are, assemble groups of people who collectively look at the patient as an individual within a population, constructing modalities for the population with a focus on the individual, you save money and that's the triple aim. All right? So this slide's sort of out of order. It's all about I to we. It's not anything any individual can do. And so one of the things that got underreported was the fact that we knocked the socks off the quality measures in the first year even, because all of our groups had independently learned how to do that in the AQC. 
So, you know, we're way above the median and best in some classes, and uh, that's going to make a difference because the first year, quality didn't count in the payoff. Now, 2013, you may save money, but you don't get it unless you hit certain quality scores. How many of you have heard the phrase, no margin, no mission? You know who said it? A nun named uh, Sister Irene Krauss. She was an amazing businesswoman. She ran the largest 501c healthcare organization in the country, um, Sisters of Charity. And uh, it's a, an example of a cliche that's been lifted out of time and put someplace else. So I hear CFOs saying that all the time to justify you know, finance and things that are pretty, I think, marginal in terms of their ethics. Sister Krauss was referring to the fact that up until the time when she enunciated this, which was in, uh, somewhere in the window of the late 70s or the early 80s, Catholic hospitals essentially functioned off philanthropy. And if they needed to build a building or if they had a shortfall in their payroll, they went to philanthropy as the source. And what she recognized was, no, you have to run it as a business. So an, another, how many of you know the book Good to Great by Jim Collins? Okay, that's a great, that's a great business book. Everyone should read it. Uh, he has a, a monograph for nonprofit organizations. And it turns out, since most of healthcare is nonprofit in this state, you should know this. There are nonprofits that function like businesses, and that's basically most of healthcare now. And there are nonprofits that function sort of like businesses and sort of like charities. That's your old alma mater, right? And Red Cross, they sell products. Uh, and then there are some that just function totally off of philanthropy. That's your church. Okay? So, so within the nonprofit evolution of healthcare, we really have to be run like businesses. But the truth is, the big thing that we're going through is getting paid for volume being shifted to getting paid for value. And as I've just pointed out with the patient satisfaction and with quality, if Sister Irene Krauss was still alive, she died in 1998, she would say no quality, no margin because that's going to be the future. No patient satisfaction, no margin. So if you're conceptualizing building a success, financially successful healthcare institution, running one or being part of one, that isn't focused on continuous improvement of quality, safety, and patient satisfaction, you are in an organization that's going to run out of money sooner or later. I don't care how rich you are right now. And if you're trying to run an organization that isn't at least thinking about the fact that healthcare is moving towards the reality that we have to reasonably cover the whole population, you're in for a lot of grief in the future. So I think we're ahead of, so here, here's where we started. After they process all the numbers, um, we then play the game. Unfortunately, we still use a lot of high cost institutions, uh, trying hard to change some of that, but nevertheless, it's not all done yet. Uh, I heard that conversation with Dr. Dupuy, and he's absolutely right. Why would you pay more for something that's just as good? Because they have a better PR department? I mean, you know, uh, if the service is good, patient satisfaction is high, and the results are spectacular, uh, they deserve your business. So we, uh, in Q3, after we got all this machinery in place, really began to, the good thing about Q4 was even, uh, Q1 of this year was even better. So when we took our defined year, modified from last year, we're going to get the double count Q1 because for us, the first year payout or loss uh, was Q2 here at 919 out to Q1 of 2012. Um, I thought I had a slide that showed it, but we're knocking the socks off of it now. So if you actually go into our organization, and this is a piece of data I've just gotten in the last week, and say, how do we perform financially against the best and the brightest in the country? The example I'm going to pull up is Thetacare Balin. So yesterday, I enjoyed a visit from John Toussaint at Atrius. And do you know John Toussaint? John Toussaint was the CEO of Thetacare. 
great book, On the Mend, uh, which is the experience of applying lean to ThetaCare. ThetaCare is a system of about four hospitals in the Fox River Valley of um, Wisconsin. Think Green Bay. Uh, so Appleton uh, is the, uh, the major trauma center in, 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 uh, of, of, the, of the general Fox River area, the, the Appleton Hospital, and that's the, the key hospital in the ThetaCare system. And when the Patriots go to play the um, Packers, they'll be in a hotel about three blocks from there. So, so bring it all together. Uh, and so that's a, that's a very homogeneous, ho homogeneous upper Midwest population. They have incredible quality, incredible costs, um, and um, it's all because they started lean 2002 because the Aryan Snowblower factory is just down the road, and they were doing it, and they learned it from them. Uh, the story at, at Virginia Mason is Boeing was doing it, and members of the Boeing board were on the Virginia Mason board, and that's how it jumped there. But uh, I think lean is key. So when I can tell you that Harvard Vanguard performed exactly as Theta Care for the year, I can tell you we're in pretty good company. So I'm very proud of, of that reality. When you take the other organizations that haven't yet adopted lean that are within Atrius, it dilutes out the experience, but we still get to a place that's really, I think, spectacular, and I'm fully uh, hopeful that within the next year uh, we'll be able to roll lean out to them. So when you roll out lean, what you're doing is you're giving 5,000 people a new vocabulary, a new set of tools, a new way of thinking, you begin, to, when you know you're successful, you begin to hear saying, well, geez, let's, we've got a problem, but let's don't jump to solution. That's pretty amazing because most of the time we say, we've got a problem, let's do something. Uh, and then when you hear a nurse say, you know, I think we should sit down and do some A3 thinking. What she's meaning is they're going to sit down and say, what is the real problem here? What's going on now? What would be better? What do we have to change to get there? What are some experiments that we could do to see if we can get there plausibly? What data points are we going to check? What are our objectives? That's lean thinking. Teach 5,000 people how to do that. You don't do it overnight. It's a five to eight year journey. We're now into our fifth year of it. And so my sense is, and I plot this out in my mind all the time, that's what we hope we will see. We get castigated in the news because our costs, our payments are high. Well, those were negotiated high. Remember, I went back. It's all coming off basically our contract with Blue Cross. We told Blue Cross, you provide us the compensation, we will retool the factory. So that, that's the deal. We've been retooling the system, the AQC, the Pioneer ACO, are all a realization that in a planful way, you have to design the system if you ever are going to have the expectation of improving the care of the individual, raising the care, uh, the quality of care in the community, and doing it for less money uh, that's within the sustainable economics of the society in which you live. 